why have we not been building nuclear recently? Is it a problem with the technology? It's really a problem with demand. Um, demand has really leveled off over the last 30 years um, in the developed world. Um, that's starting to change, you know, as we um, have increased organic demand, and that's partially because we're starting to reshore manufacturing because we've decided that um, offshore and particularly our critical and geostrategic industries was maybe not such a great idea, uh, but also with our ambitions around electrification of the economy. <laughs>
pretty phenomenally dangerous, maybe uniquely dangerous uh, form of of waste, you know, something you don't even need to touch or ingest at that point uh, to receive a lethal dose. There's this interesting paradox, though, you know, something that's that's this immediately dangerous um, has never resulted in a single human uh, casualty, let alone fatality, in the history of civilian nuclear power. So that's over 70 years now of handling this stuff. And why is that? Um, it's because we make dangerous things safe. So I'm going to make a little comparison here, um, and we'll look at the technological complexity of of managing risk. <clears throat> so let's let's jump over and and follow me along here. But let's think about aviation. So we cram, you know, 100, 200, maybe 300 men, women, and children into uh, a modern jetliner. We put them up at 30,000 feet, traveling seven, 800 kilometers per hour. The air up there is so thin that you would, you know, die pretty quickly if the cabin depressurizes. Um, you've got a thousand plus, you know, essential moving parts, mission critical moving parts. If they fail, you could have a an accident which ends the lives of every single person on board. You've got um, uh, all kinds of things that can go wrong in the in the cockpit. Um, you know, if air traffic control issues, and yet somehow we make all of that complexity incredibly safe, the safest form of human transportation, eight teams, 18 times safer than driving. There was 4.3 billion passenger flights in 2013 um, and under 200 deaths as a result of aviation. So something that's incredibly risky, um, almost preposterously risky, and we worry more about what the in-flight movie is going to be or what the snacks are going to be um, than, than any kind of harm coming to us. So making that comparison to nuclear waste, something that is very dangerous in a, in a different way, again, particularly fresh out of the reactor, nuclear waste, absolutely deadly. Um, why has it never harmed anybody? Well, because we know how to deal with it. Um, and so nuclear waste comes out of the reactor underwater. We un Water is an incredible shield for radiation. I've walked around fresh nuclear waste, fresh out of the reactor, inside a pool under about 20 feet of water, and my dose much less than flying in an airplane. Okay, so we keep wow. it underwater. Um, for four or five, maybe up to 10 years. And then we transfer it underwater into what are called dry cask containers, which are steel um, and concrete uh, containers. And the waste sits there for 100, maybe 200 years. And then we have to figure out what to do with it from that point. And that might be recycling. There's about 95% of the original energy is still in that nuclear waste if it's harnessed with a different kind of fast neutron reactor, which we can maybe get into later if we want to nerd out. Um, or, you know, we could bury it deep underground. There's all kinds of solutions, but here's a really critical thing beyond making dangerous things safe. Nuclear waste very rapidly gets safer all on its own. So there's all kinds of different half-lives you mentioned. There's the really long half-lives, which are interestingly the ones we need to worry about the least because where the danger happens is when, you know, an atom splits, it releases energy and that energy is, is radiation can potentially harm us. If you're having a decay, you know, you mentioned uranium, the uh, the most uh, common isotope of uranium, U-238, its half-life is actually 2.3 billion years. That means every 2.3 billion years, some radiation is emitted. So that's not really a big concern. Um, the stuff that's spicy is, is the things with very short half-lives that are splitting every few seconds, every few minutes and emitting radiation. That stuff decays away very quickly as an, uh, you know, as a byproduct of its half-life. And so... Within 40 years, 99.9% .9 of that radioactivity that we were talking about initially fresh out of the reactor is gone. It's called exponential radioactive decay. And you know, within 400, 500 years, you could hold nuclear waste in your hand, you know, in your gloved hand or even no gloves, and you'd be safe. You wouldn't be getting any kind of dose that would have any kind of health impact. And so, yeah, I mean, we have to manage it for that time period. Um, but, you know... Other other things that we've managed successfully for hundreds of years, the the nuclear waste storage facility in in uh, the Netherlands, I think, is actually a really incredible um, example of best practices with waste management. So they have their high level nuclear waste stored in in uh, cylinders underneath the floor of an art gallery, and they display works of art that are four, five hundred, six hundred years old, very fragile works of art. You know, canvas painted with you know some kinds of paints that are probably concocted from animal fats and various pigments. You know, and we maintain those in beautiful condition. So we can do similar things with waste. Again, gets less dangerous over time. Um, and the amount that we create is, this is kind of the final point, the volume created is very small. Because you can imagine if you have an enormous volume of anything, it becomes a challenge to, to manage that. You can think about plastic waste ending up in the ocean, for instance. Because uranium is so incredibly energy dense, you know, millions of times more than fossil fuels, that means we need millions of times less of it. 
So, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what nuclear waste is, the stuff we worry about, the high-level nuclear waste, this is, a, you know, ceramic pellets of, of, uh, of uranium. And so each pellet, about the size of a gummy bear, um, can power in Canada um, 100 homes. Uh, no, sorry, this is a fuel bundle. I'm getting confused here. Each, each pellet, about four pellets, will give you all the electricity that you require for an entire year. So that gives you a sense of how little uranium you need. Um, and how little waste comes out the back end. And so, you know, in Canada, I'm more familiar with the Canadian numbers, but, you know, we've been using um, nuclear energy for about 16% of our electricity across the whole country. Um, and we've created enough nuclear waste to fill one hockey rink, piled one telephone pole high. A very Canadian reference for you there. But that gives you a sense about the volumes, right? And then, yeah, this stuff is dangerous. We have to, you know, move it into containers, maybe at that 200-year point, move it into a fresh container, that's a very manageable thing to do with that volume of waste. So I guess in summary, we make dangerous things safe. There's never been any casualty uh, documented from handling that waste. It rapidly gets safer over time, and we produce very little of it. There, there's my environmentalist case for nuclear waste. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're more likely to get into an accident driving on the highway than you are, you know, riding on a plane getting into an accident there. Uh, to your point, you know, that's very, you know, I've never heard it put that way uh, in terms of the safety of nuclear power. Um, very interesting stuff. So you mentioned fast neutron reactor. Um, can you get into what exactly that is? Sure. And, sure. Uh, what, so, what, what's the level, of, like how far down the line that is to implementation? Yeah. Yeah. So our current uh, reactors, um, basically, you know, what happens when you have a chain reaction, which starts to unleash um, nuclear energy in a controlled fashion, you know, or in a bomb, if, if you, uh, you know, highly enrich uranium or use plutonium, um, what you're looking for is this chain reaction. So, you know, a uranium atom splits or plutonium atom splits and it emits neutrons, which then go on and hit these other heavy, unstable elements. And so, um, what we rely upon now to, in to increase the likelihood that you're going to have more of these, um, fission events is we want to slow those neutrons down. So they're more likely to interact with other uranium atoms. Um, and the ones that tend to fission in this way are the U-235. So uranium is made up of two isotopes, U-235, about 0.7% of naturally occurring uranium, and U-238, um, which is the other, you know, 99.3%. Um, and so we're able to fission that 0.7% using slowed down neutrons. Um, if we are able to run reactors at this fast spectrum, then we can start to split that U-238, which is the vast majority of the uranium that's available. Now we, you know, in, in US style reactors, we enrich the uranium, that U-235 ratio up to three to 5%, um, which, you know, allows us, it, it's, it's a bit complicated in terms of the reactor physics, but you get the point. So why are we not pursuing this fast spectrum uh, reactors? Well, we are. Um, the Russians have actually successfully deployed uh, sodium cooled fast reactors. Um, which can use this U-238 um, as fuel or even use nuclear waste as fuel because, again, most of what remains uh, in that waste is actually just the U-238 that we weren't able to, to use. Um, so, you know, the technology is out there right now. It's not as commercially developed. Um, and there's not really an urgency to do it because, you know, at the beginning of nuclear power, um, you know, I guess similar to oil and gas, like in the early days of oil and gas, like there was a panic in the 1920s that, you know, we'd hit peak oil and it was game over and we needed to move to making synthetic fuels. The Germans actually took that quite a long ways down the road um, and not having their own petroleum and being kind of navally blockaded easily um, and not having pipelines coming to their country. They actually went big on synthetic fuels and that's what powered a lot of the Nazi war effort. It, it didn't have a great energy return and energy invested, which was, you know, one factor as to why, you know, the German war machine, uh, you know, puffed itself out. Um, but similar dynamic with uranium in the early days, um, we thought it was a really limited resource, there wasn't much around. And so there was a big move towards um, starting to develop these, these different reactor types. Um, but we eventually found that the world's actually, you know, it's very abundant uranium reserves all over the world. Um, and it's cheaper to run these uh, slow neutron reactors. And so that's essentially what we've been doing. Um, but there's every, you know, not it's not only a theoretical possibility, there's reactors that are operating again commercially in Russia, um, which use uh, this fast neutron technology. So not an urgent priority, but let's say, you know, we went big on nuclear and we did consume a lot of the world's uranium reserves or the ore grades got lower and lower. Um, definitely something that I think we would move towards 
um, and that that would be viable. Yeah, I mean, and you would think it would be a priority given like all the, you know, like we mentioned before, the anxiety behind nuclear waste. And I mean, that's like the main argument that I hear against adopting your uh, nuclear power. Yeah. So. And, um, and it's really, it's really incredible. And, and the reason why that argument persists in the way that it does is because the nuclear industry itself um, basically suck at communications. And, you know, they're dominated by really, really intelligent engineers and engineers love solving problems. Um, the problem with nuclear waste is a perception problem and a communications problem, as I've hopefully demonstrated with you and your listenership. But what the nuclear industry will do is say, OK, you're terrified of nuclear waste. We're going to scare you even more by talking about all the ways that we can over engineer more and more layers of safety into this, um, that we need to handle nuclear waste in a very different fashion than all, you know, number of other really different uh, and dangerous types of waste. So we're going to develop, you know, storage facilities that will be, you know, contain this waste for millions and millions of years and no radiation whatsoever will, will escape. And I'll give you an example, um, the deep geologic repository that's being planned for Canada, where I live, um, <clears throat> You know, I talked to the the designers about it because you know they're you know going to bury the stuff more than you know half a kilometer underground in this really perfect rock formation. Uh, the the waste, which is a, you know solid fuel pellets in their zirconium cladding, is going to be put in you know further containers, concrete and steel packed with clay. There's all sorts of these engineered barriers as well as the natural barrier of the rock, and this is all about trying to prevent water from infiltrating in dissolving a solid ceramic you can think about trying to dissolve a coffee cup um, <clears throat> and carrying those radionuclides back out through the rock so i talked to the um the the safety modelers about this and i'm like give me your worst case scenario and you know they really try and disadvantage themselves so their worst case scenario <clears throat> is that you know there's this all cask failure scenario so those those copper lines you know steel casks um fail. And it's not just that there's a little crack and water infiltrates slowly in through a weld and saturates the fuel and somehow uh, dissolves the ceramic in a no oxygen environment, which really doesn't happen and then works its way back out. They say, okay, there's no casks. You know, there's a huge geologic fault we hadn't accounted for. The maximally exposed person, you know, farms on, you know, the land right above it has a well there. All of their food comes from there. They live every day of their life there. The maximum dose occurs in a million years. And it's 80 nanosieverts mm. per year, which is about a thousand times less dose than you get from having a, 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 a radiation-based smoke detector in our house. And that's the most common form of smoke detector in our house. And so the nuclear industry itself, um, you know, rather than communicating with the public, you know, telling the story and putting nuclear waste in context and even bragging about it, they take it the other direction and they really scare people because they go, listen, that copper container, we are engineering it. So it'll last a million years and people are skeptical about it. And then they go, man, this stuff must be crazy dangerous. Is it going to just geyser to the ground like lava and kill us all? Is it, is it a nuclear bomb? Um, and so, you know, that's, I think, you know, the nuclear industry is almost as guilty as the environmental movement for turning nuclear waste into this bogeyman. And, you know, particularly for those of us who are climate concerned, it's incredible to me that we've got this microscope over nuclear waste and the quantities are truly microscopic in the context of all the other waste streams and particularly the CO2 waste stream. And, you know, got our back turned to, you know, the forms of energy which nuclear is best positioned to replace, you know, like the natural gas emissions or the coal emissions. And a perfect example of that's Germany, which just shuttered its nuclear fleet um, while reactivating a number of mothballed coal plants to get themselves through this uh, energy crisis they've they've got themselves into by hooking themselves up like addicts to to cheap Russian gas. Yeah, and um, you know, just to kind of you know shine a little bit more light on your uh, point there about engineering and messaging in, in the nuclear industry, um, engineers have a tendency, from my experience, is have a tendency to be correct but not right in the eyes of the public. So yes, you're correct. Right. You know, you do need all of this layering of protection to, but the public is not going to receive that. You know, just because you're correct doesn't mean you're right in the eyes of the public. Right. So. Yeah. And, yeah, and if I can just, if I can just follow up on that. So our current plan with this deep geologic repository, the budget is $26 billion with a B, right. Um, to create this elaborate, you know, mined um, storage facility, <clears throat> all kinds of equipment, these crazy safety containers. Uh, um, so $26 billion, I don't know, Canada's, you know, not a tiny country, we're a pretty wealthy country, but that's a significant, excuse me, significant mobilization of societal resources, um, you know, which I think could be better spent on a more urgent problem 
if climate's your thing, then then that might be climate. You could build, you know, a, a good number of nuclear plants for that and further decarbonize your electricity, give yourself the juice to electrify as much as possible, for instance. Um, but because of this perceived urgency of managing nuclear waste, which has never harmed anybody, has a perfect safety record, perfect containment record, um, this this seems to be a priority. And and when I talk to the planners, I'm like, okay, so how much of that budget could we shave shave off if we're willing to tolerate, you know, a maximum dose in a very unrealistic worst case scenario of, let's say, a banana's worth of radiation per year, which is, you know, about 100 times more radiation in a banana because of a radioactive isotope naturally occurring potassium 40. Um, you know, what would that cost? Could we shave 12 billion, 20 billion off of that price tag? And so... <clears throat> You know, it's kind of the sky's the limit in terms of what the nuclear industry is is kind of willing to pay to manage a problem that's that's just not a problem. And you know, we can probably talk about radiation and health impacts of radiation and and you know put those in a context as well later on if, if that's of interest to you. But that's obviously, you know, the the big kind of source of of fear um, I think that people have regarding nuclear, whether that's the waste or or problems like accidents or things like that. Yeah, I mean, let's dive right into it then. Uh, I mean, the most recent accident being Fukushima. <clears throat> uh, is that still a problem? <clears throat> Sorry, is that still a problem given, um, you know, the, the spent fuel rods being dumped in the ocean and all this kind of stuff? Okay, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. so, I, I hear I hear a lot of people still saying that, oh, we're they're still spilling radiation into the Pacific and it's traveling mm -hmm. all the way up to Alaska and mutating the sockeye salmon and all this kind of stuff. So right. what, what's, what's your take there? Yeah, I mean, so first off, spent fuel rods not being not being dumped in the ocean, yeah. um, but we'll we'll break that down a little bit. Listen, I think um, you know Fukushima uh, happened after Chernobyl. We have to kind of jump back to Chernobyl for a second. So, um, you know, Chernobyl uh, is a very different type of reactor design. Um, it used graphite to slow down those neutrons that we were talking about. Um, graphite can catch on fire when it heats up. Um, not a great. Not a great reactor design, no containment, um, and we had you know the world's worst nuclear energy accident, um, which you know according to the best scientific studies has resulted in less than a hundred deaths um, over the almost forty years since it occurred. And that might that might you know sound really nonsensical to people that have heard numbers like a million deaths, you know hundreds of thousands, thirty thousand. Um, one has to look at the quality of of the evidence and the quality of the studies, as we've seen with COVID and with the weaponization of the quote unquote science um, by by folks who are really not um, well equipped to analyze the quality of the science. Um, you know, it's it's phenomenal. I'd really suggest that people are curious about this to to have a look at at that. It's it, the studies that are referenced around a million deaths, a hundred thousand deaths, sponsored by Greenpeace Europe. Uh, you know, the million death count was by the founder of of Greenpeace Russia, um, and you know, the study I'm referencing under a hundred deaths to date is uh, eight UN agencies, including the World Health Organization, the cooperation of all three of the most affected countries, et cetera. But Chernobyl is a different kind of reactor, right? It's not a pressurized water reactor. The Fukushima accident, it was the simultaneous meltdown of three gigawatt scale um, boiling water reactors, right? It, you know, And it was caused by a tidal wave um, by, you know, I think the fourth most powerful earthquake ever measured. This earthquake shifted the axis of the earth several centimeters, um, you know, a pretty major force of nature. And this might surprise people because they've probably heard like, well, there's 20, 30,000 people killed by Fukushima. Those people were killed by the earthquake and the tsunami, not the, not the nuclear accident. So no one has died as a consequence of the radiation released by the simultaneous meltdown of three, you know, very large nuclear reactors. Um, there were deaths as a result of a panicked evacuation. And it, it, you know, that's that's interesting to me because it's the folks who fearmonger about radiation who I think kind of have their blood have the blood on the hands around that one. Um, because in a nuclear accident, um, you know, the amount of radiation released is actually quite small. The doses received by the public are um, similar to medical doses of radiation. So in the Three Mile Island meltdown, the maximum dose um, absorbed by a member of the public was around that of a chest X-ray, right? And in Fukushima, we're talking a CT scan worth of radiation to maximally expose people. So what you do in a nuclear accident is you close your windows and you stay inside for a few days. That's that's how to best manage it. And you don't eat, you don't drink milk from cattle in the area, and you import your food from outside of the immediate area. That's That's how you best respond to a nuclear accident. People don't do that because they're terrified of nuclear bombs, 
Um, there's a very good reason, and I'm empathetic to why people are uniquely scared about radiation. Um, so in terms of the health consequences from radiation, again, zero deaths as a consequence of the triple meltdown of three reactors. So these water-based reactors are very, very safe, even in the worst case scenario. They become costly industrial accidents, right? Three Mile Island, that reactor was less than a year into operation, you know, billions of dollars invested. Um, the investors weren't happy, but there wasn't a health, a measurable health impact as a consequence. Um, you know, what I think really um, is compelling, though, beyond the the dangers or the lack thereof of, of radiation from that accident is the cleanup, right? And people see thousands of, I forget the exact size of the water containers, right? But um, water that's being used to, to cool the site, um, it's being filtered of all the dangerous um, isotopes, except for tritium, which is an isotope of hydrogen, which is very hard to separate from water. And they've been holding it there, and they're talking about releasing that into the ocean, right? Or you'll see fields, very highly productive agricultural fields being the topsoil being bulldozed and put into plastic bags being held at the edge of fields. They're estimating about $100 billion um, into the cleanup of Fukushima. And I think that should get, give anyone pause, $100 billion. You know, again, a massive allocation of, of societal resources. Is that necessary? So the whole rationale for, for that $100 billion um, remediation effort is to get the dose of radiation, the extra dose from the nuclear accident down to less than one millisievert per year. Now that's a unit that people aren't pretty familiar with. So let me, you know, help break that down. Um, that's half of a CT scan of your head, which is delivered in the emergency department in a few seconds. And, you know, this would be over a year getting half that dose. <clears throat> let me put that into further context. I live uh, in Ontario. My natural background dose from radon gas in my basement, from the food that I eat, from cosmic radiation, from the flights that I take is about 2.5 millisieverts per year. If you live in Denver, Colorado, you're at a higher elevation, there's a bit more uranium in the soil, you're at 10 millisieverts per year, right? If you live in Kerala, India, you're about 50 millisieverts per year. Would you bulldoze the beaches of Kerala in an effort to try and reduce radiation exposure, you know, from the Japanese average of about two millisieverts, um, you know, uh, with Fukushima added on top to three millisieverts, or would you be okay with, you know, having a background radiation level similar to Denver, Colorado at 10 millisieverts? Well, well don't, don't right. tell so, the activists that you might give them some, you might give them some bad ideas. Yeah. Yeah. You know, who knows? Right. But th this is the thing is, is radiation, um, especially at low doses is an incredibly weak carcinogen compared to, you know, every other carcinogen we know, but particularly chemotoxins, chemical toxins. And so, <clears throat> I don't know, I might be boring your listeners here, but, um, you know, I think I think the issue with Fukushima is um, for me anyway, like when I when I understand the radiation harms, which are are really negligible, um, is is that is that cleanup? Um, you know, people hear about the the release of you said spent fuel rods. That's you know, I forgive you. That's a, you know, someone who's not like deep, being, deep being diving this. Yeah, I was yeah. being sarcastic for a second. There. No, for sure, for no, sure. No. Um, you know, the tritium issue, right? And so tritium is uh, is radioactive. It's an isotope of hydrogen. Um, it has uh, a couple extra neutrons um, compared to just the hydrogen molecule. It is very, very, very weakly radioactive. You'll hear yeah. figures about the millions and millions of liters of water, radioactive water, that's about to be released into the ocean. That water contains three grams of tritium. You might have heard as well of, of the you know Monticello tritium leak in, in Minnesota, a nuclear plant in Minnesota, right? Where they talked again, I think it's about 400,000 gallons of water that leaked on that site containing tritium. The amount of tritium that leaked at Monticello was one third of the tritium you'd find in a emergency exit sign. You know, they have these tritium emergency exit signs. Tritium is used because it has uh, this characteristic of, of you know, phosphorescence of creating light. You don't need to have electricity. If you want to have an emergency exit sign that never goes dark or you have a place without uh, electricity or you don't want to rely on batteries, you use a tritiated exit sign. So, you know, people were freaking out about the Monticello tritium release and the amount of tritium released was one third of a single emergency exit sign. So the amount of tritium that's being released is is very small, and it is one of the most weakly radioactive radioisotopes out there. It dilutes into water immediately. Um, it's not a health concern, um, but it's being made into one by by you know fear mongering environmentalists who you know in my mind are scor scoring own goals on themselves by opposing a form of energy which has the greatest promise in terms of you know carbon emissions reductions, air pollution, uh, minimizing mining um, for. For uh, you know, producing 
clean energy. So I don't know, a little bit of a diatribe there, but that's that's kind of Fukushima in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. So great stuff. So we've covered the radiation side of things. We've covered the nuclear waste side of things. Any other big misconceptions before we uh, kind of leave the perceived downsides and move over to the to the upsides of nuclear power? <clears throat> I spent a lot of time um, responding to what I call the three W's. Um, so waste, uh, weapons, and whoops, whoops being the accidents. Um, and they're important questions to answer for people. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a worthy endeavor. Um, but often I spend sort of so much time on the defensive that I don't have time to talk about what I perceive really as the positives and to paint, you know, an optimistic future where, um, you know, we really shift towards a far greater reliance on, on nuclear, not as the only source of energy. That's just unrealistic. Um, nuclear has great applications. It's, it can replace a lot of fossil fuel services, but certainly not all of them. Um, you know, it pairs ex excellently with hydroelectricity, but, you know, nuclear is our most scalable form of reliable, dispatchable energy that we can run a modern civilization on. And that future um, looks pretty great. And I, I can talk, I think, with a fair amount of confidence in that because I live um, in a jurisdiction that's 60 percent nuclear powered. And there's a lot, a lot of benefits to that. So I'm, I'm happy to sort of move on from the three W's. Um, into uh, into talking about uh, what I think is a very positive vision for the future. Yeah, so uh, we have a small a small modular reactors uh, coming on the menu. How long does it take to fully onboard a small modular reactor and, and um, you know push it into implementation? Right. How, so how, how, yeah, so. <clears throat> so the average time worldwide, um, looking at basically every nuclear plant that's ever been built. Um, and these are generally large reactors because there's been a tendency with economies of scale to trend towards a gigawatt scale reactor or, um, you know, enough, enough power for a million homes essentially is a way to think about it. Um, and so, uh, the average time to do that is eight years. Obviously recently the West has, um, performed very poorly. Um, you know, the Vogel reactor, which was the only kind of new reactors to come online in the States in the last 20 or 30 years, um, big delays, you know, 13, 14 years, there's some reactors in Europe that are, you know, hitting kind of 20 years, um, which is clearly not acceptable, but the world average is eight years. The, the quickest, um, build ever was in Japan where they got it down to, I believe 38 months. Um, wow. so under four years, um, what I'll say is that nuclear is, is hard. Um, it's a very complex and difficult construction project. There's a huge value proposition there uh, because this is energy infrastructure um, that lasts, you know, we're seeing 60, 80 years, possibly longer. It's kind of like a hydro dam. Hydro dams can, you know, go for a century, maybe more. It's kind of untested. Um, but with careful monitoring, we can figure out how long they'll last. And, and you know, there's no reason that nuclear, there's this number of nuclear plants that are being relicensed to 80 years uh, Um so a long-term value proposition, uh, but very complex to build. And it requires, you know, a lot of institutional excellence. It requires very skilled project managers, very skilled tradespeople, requires a supply chain that manufactures to a very, very high level of quality control. So if those ingredients are not there, then you end up having problems like you did at Vogel or like you're having in Europe, where you have atrophied supply chains, uh, atrophied workforces, atrophied project management skills, and you're, you know, cost schedule and building schedule can go off the rails, right? So nuclear is sensitive to incompetence in that sense. Um, so that can be a story of, you know, throwing your hands up in the air and saying, oh, we just shouldn't do it. We can't do it. We suck. Human beings are, you know, are, are not capable. Or, you know, I think we can aspire to greatness. Um, and every country that's deployed nuclear around the world um, has had a, a golden decade or two um, you know, in the U.S. in the 60s and 70s, reactors were being brought online uh, incredibly uh, effectively and at a price cheaper than coal. Um, you know, in, in Canada, where I live, we, we commissioned 22 reactors in 22 years. You'll hear, well, nuclear is not fast enough. You build them in, in fleet mode. You can bring a lot of electricity on, online quickly. And that's now 60 percent of the electricity in the province of Ontario, where I live. Uh, in France, uh, 54 reactors commissioned in 15 years. So this, this can be done quite quickly. If you hear just, well, each one's going to take eight years, that's not going to be ready in time to deal with the climate crisis. Well, then build a bunch at the same time, right? Um, you know, more contemporarily, the United Arab Emirates um, have brought uh, four very large nuclear reactors online over the course of about 12 years. Um, so, you know, in terms of the speed, like I said, it's sensitive to um, 
to atrophied supply chains and workforces. Unfortunately, that's the case in the West recently. Um, and that kind of brings you to the question of, well, like, why have we not been building nuclear recently? Is it a problem with the technology? It's really a problem with demand. Um, demand has really leveled off over the last 30 years um, in the developed world. Um, that's starting to change, you know, as we um, have increased organic demand. And that's partially because we're starting to reshore manufacturing because we've decided that um, offshoring, particularly our critical and geostrategic industries, was maybe not such a great idea. Uh, but also with our ambitions around electrification of the economy and with the aging out of, of you know, certain assets like our coal plants and, and others. Um, so there's now an imperative of, you know, organic increases in electricity demand, which make nuclear a very attractive option going forward. And that's why I think, um, you know, your listeners are probably aware of whispers of a of a nuclear renaissance that coming that's coming. Not not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. But that that's something I think we can um, be uh, hopeful and optimistic about if if we are optimistic people. Yeah. So what about nuclear fusion? That, you know, that made the headlines for about a, a month or two and then kind of fizzled out. Is that, you know, where does that kind of paint nuclear fission in light of you know, all, all right. of that messaging of nuclear fusion? And is there more to the story? You know, are, are we a lot further out in actually adopting nuclear fusion than we're, you know, been made out to to believe? Right, right. So, you know, the the phenomenon of, of splitting very heavy atoms um, was discovered in the 1930s. And by 1956, we had a commercial nuclear reactor selling electricity onto a grid. You know, the concept of fusion, um, the ability to, to fuse very light atoms together to basically replicate the conditions of the sun to some degree in terms of extreme heat, extreme pressure. Um, that was done, you know, in the explosion of a hydrogen bomb. Um, and we um, have been able to recreate that um, but we've not gotten anywhere near uh, commercial power generation in terms of the energy in versus the energy out. And, you know, that's approaching 60, 70 years. So you're getting a sense of how easy each of these phenomena are. Um, and when I say not even close, I mean it. Uh, you might have heard of this um, experiment. Um, it's called inertial confinement. Basically, you're you're setting off a whole bunch of mini <laughs> hydrogen bombs using uh, laser for the energy source. Um, and so, you know, two megajoules of energy were put in, uh, three megajoules of energy came out. Um, the laser that delivered those two megajoules required 500 megajoules of energy to fire up. And then, you know, that heat would need to be usually be used to boil water, make steam with efficiency losses of around 60%. Um, the, the engineering required is, is highly, highly complex. Um, the fuel is that people say, well, you're just turning water into energy. Um, it's not water. Um, you're needing to use isotopes of water, um, like deuterium or tritium. Um, so it's, uh, for me, it's something that's a very interesting science experiment. We learn a lot about particle physics, um, but this is not a viable form of energy generation. And I think is unlikely really to ever become a viable form of energy generation. Um, because again, I'm just the, these, these very, the very difference in these challenges. Fission, I think is, is very attractive and fusion doesn't solve, um, you know, any of these so-called intractable, intractable problems of nuclear fission. You still get radioactive waste out the back end. There's a lot of neutrons emitted that that's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a slightly different waste stream. There's still a huge tie into nuclear weapons, right? Um, this is the same, you know, the people working on, um, on that fusion experiment, it's at a national laboratory, um, which is uh, mostly funded uh, by nuclear weapons research. Um, so, you know, I think there's a big attraction to fusion because it, it doesn't really yet exist. And we can pin all of our optimism and hopes to it and not have to deal with the technology um, that we have demonstrated and that it has, um, like any technology, um, some hiccups. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, to try and answer more succinctly, um, I, I, I don't see fusion being disruptive in any way, shape or form. Um, and certainly um, not a not a viable um, replacement for fossil fuel services on anything like a time scale, um, you know, uh, of even centuries at this point. Wow. Uh, any other like emerging technologies that you're really excited about? You know, we, we talked about fast neutron reactors. We talked about SMRs. Um, <laughs> You know, what, what, what else is on your radar? 
Yeah, I mean, so in terms of, you know, reducing carbon emissions, um, you know, we hear a lot about the need to electrify everything. Um, there's limits to, to what can be electrified. Um, I think, you know, I've, I've learned to become a much more nuanced on the question, not necessarily of the dangers of climate change, but of the kind of Gordian knot that needs to be untied um, to actually reduce carbon emissions. I don't think that net zero is a possibility even. And if it is, it's a centuries or millennial long project. Um, and that's not because I'm not a fan of of trying to move quickly um, on dealing with climate change. It's the fact that we are a fossil fueled civilization. Um, you know, if the Just Stop Oil or um, Extinction Rebellion activists had their way and we didn't take another drop of hydrocarbons um, out of the soil, their fantasies and apocalyptic fears of billions of deaths would manifest, you know, on a decade time scale as the world's soils depleted um, and we didn't have the nitrogen required to grow the crops, crops to feed humanity. You know, it's estimated um, that without synthetic fertilizers, we'd only be able to support a population of 4 billion. Um, so there, there you have your billions dead in, you know, by 2030 or 2040 or whatever that, that these folks uh, talk about. Um, this doesn't diminish the the need to act on climate change, um, but the the tools that we're using, I think, are generally speaking the wrong ones. Um, you know, even on the uh, I've been thinking a lot about and researching around electric vehicles recently. Um, you know, my government calls them zero emissions vehicles, which is just not true. There's a huge amount of embodied emissions. Uh, batteries require a, a huge amount of mining. Um, it takes tens, maybe even 100,000 kilometers of driving an EV to get to a lower emission profile than an ICE vehicle. This is not a panacea um, that somehow somehow solves all our problems. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, breakthrough technologies that are on the horizon, I mean, I'm excited about uh, deep geothermal. I think there's some mm -hmm. potential there. Um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't, I don't fetishize nuclear technology. Um, I apply um, you know, a number of, uh, I, I try and address a number of goals and see which technologies yeah. match up right now. Nuclear, I think has, uh, you know, the most promise, um, as a viable replace, viable most replacement for, yeah. for, for, for some fossil fuel services. Um, you know, process heat is, is another, um, you know, very difficult to decarbonize area. Um, fossil fuels can get you up to the kind of heat required for a lot of metallurgy and chemical processes. Um, nuclear has that capability with high temperature gas reactors. Um, and so that's uh, something that I think is emerging. You've heard Dow Chemical um, is planning on deploying the X Energy high temperature gas reactor to uh, to fuel some of their, uh, their industrial processes. So I think that's something definitely to keep an eye on. Awesome. Well, I uh, want to be mindful of your time here, Chris. Uh, are there any parting thoughts you want to leave the audience with before, before we sign off? I'm going on three hours of sleep right now, so uh, I, I might be drawing a few blanks here. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I think I think people, um, you know, and, and I, your your podcast is geared towards uh, probably the investment community. Um you know, in terms of the the investment case for nuclear, I think that's changing quite rapidly. Um, we've seen um, nuclear inclusive green bonds. Um, we've seen a lot of positive statements from major financial institutions. Obviously, um, there's you know the whole phenomenon of of uh, uranium uh, speculation, um, and uh, I think I think we're we're seeing a real sea change. There's a lot of reluctance from yeah. the financial community. <laughs> Um, again, because of the perception um, that the nuclear is a very high risk construction project, and those fears are merited when looking at um, the recent experience in the US and Europe. Um, but I think, I think, um, you know, in terms of what leads to nuclear deployment, we talked about the need for increasing demand. And obviously, the other thing is, is energy security, fuel security. Um, and that's why if you look around the world where nuclear has been most widely deployed, um, you know, in the U.S. quite a bit because there was a desire to master this technology. Um, but in a lot of other places, like where I'm talking to you from, you know, no significant natural gas reserves, no coal reserves. Um, you know, we were importing coal. We were sending money abroad for our energy needs. Um, and we decided, you know, we have a lot of uh, of engineering experience. We have a very developed nuclear research sector. Let's let's gamble on this and, and see what we can do. Can we have our own source of energy that's that's secure? Um, and we've done that. That's a big reason why Japan used to be 30% nuclear powered. Um, they burned through their coal during their industrialization. Um, and, um, you know, you can import tiny amounts of uranium and store years worth of that fuel on site. And it makes you, you know, fairly immune to energy shocks like we're seeing right now. So hence, hence the real kind of return to nuclear. 
Um, and I look forward to seeing sort of where that goes and how the financial community, um, you know, interacts with this with this um, new enthusiasm towards nuclear. Yeah, we're, um, you know, it's, it's totally, you know, changed you know, over the last couple of years. Uh, we've seen a huge shift in, you know, investor mindset into nuclear power and um, just the community on Twitter, um, on Reddit and so forth. Uh, you're starting to see a lot of the younger generation come in um, and really, um, you know, move forward with, you know, this kind of thesis. Awesome. Well, uh, where can, uh, you know, remind the audience, where can we find you, Chris? Sure. So easiest place to to follow me and get in touch with me, my DMs are open, is Twitter, um, at Dr. underscore Kiefer, um, K-E-E-F is in France, E-R. Um, I run a nonprofit called Canadians for Nuclear Energy. So if any of your listeners are up here in Canada and interested in, um, you know, acting upon this thesis or advocating, um, that website is c4ne.ca. That's the numeral four. Um, we just launched a really uh, exciting campaign called the case for Candu, which is our our indigenous reactor technology. So listeners can check that out. Uh, but as I said, my DMs are open um, and happy to chat with uh, interested people and answer further questions. Great. Well, uh, guys, if you enjoyed this content here with Chris, be sure to give it a like and a subscribe to see more guests on the show like this. And uh, with that said, I will see you in the next video. Bye, y'all.